Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayic. Major show alert. The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. Well, hello everyone. It's just so lovely to be here and to share with you some hopefully unique thoughts that you haven't heard already today about value stream transformation. Um, when I learned, when I got into the lean management movement back in 2000, 2001, uh, value stream mapping was one of the first techniques I learned that just blew my mind. And there's really only been two techniques within the value, within the lean management movement that were truly, truly unique that I'd never been exposed to back in my total quality management days. And value stream mapping was one of them. And I just fell in love with it immediately. It felt that it solved so many problems that I'd like to share with you today and hopefully steer you toward maybe some better practices and what things to avoid that we commonly see, some patterns that we see. And then a little bit about psychology because a lot of people think about mapping as a technical you know, thing, that a method that you use and it's technical and it does have a very technical aspect to it. But there's so much more power behind value stream thinking, value stream management and value stream mapping, uh, which you use to analyze and design a better value stream that a lot of people forget to use psychology in your favor so you can get better results. So I hope to share a lot of that with you as well. So let's get going. Most of you, I'm sure, know what a value stream is, but just in case you've just helicoptered in and you know this is something kind of new to you, I just wanted to set us on a level playing field, what a value stream is. So it's basically every activity that people do, whether it's considered value adding or not in the current state, every activity that people do to, and every decision they make, by the way, also, to deliver on some sort of a request from a customer. So everything starts with some sort of a request. It can be a request for a service, a product, some sort of knowledge. It can be any kind of a request. And then there's receipt of that request. And in between that, that whole section is the value stream. Now, people use the word process a lot and process can mean many things to many people and it has many different levels of granularity. We actually differentiate quite you know, specifically between a value stream and a process, a value stream, very macro level view of a work system process, a very micro view of a work system. And so we do that so that people don't get confused. But if you use the word process generically, then everything's a process. Um, but again, we, we try to discern between those two to make, make it different between macro and micro. So a value stream is delivering value to a customer, whether it's an internal customer or an external customer. What is interesting about the whole way that we organize ourselves as businesses, and we've been doing this for decades and decades and decades and decades and decades, is that we are typically a bunch of functional silos that may or may not be connected together that are trying to deliver value to a customer. Well, the customer doesn't want the pieces of the value stream, they want the output of the value stream. And so it kind of makes no sense that we're structured in these file in these functional silos when in fact the customer views work as it goes across all holistically and in one one flow uh, as it were. So something to think about from the beginning is does this organizational structure still make sense in 2022? I would argue it probably never made sense, but it especially doesn't make sense in 2022. But now what we know about value streams. Now, back to the value stream process thing. And what, what I'm leading into is that we see a lot of so-called value stream maps that are process maps. And it's really important to leverage what you can gain from a true value stream map. And so I want to discern between the two. So think of a value stream view as a helicopter hovering above a complicated freeway system where there are interchanges. And think about the view you get from that high level uh, perspective. You can see, for example, where traffic is you know, kind of jammed up up here in the upper uh, right-hand corner. You can see where traffic is flowing or where there's no traffic at all and everything in between. When you look at work systems and workflow from a value stream perspective, that's exactly what you're looking at is this high level view because you can see flow and lack of flow 
very differently than you can at a micro level or process level. When you're at the process level, it's like you're on the highway. Then you can see a few cars in front of you, some behind you if you look in your mirror, maybe a couple to the side, but your perspective is quite local. We sometimes call it in the weeds. You're you know, down in the ground and you simply can't see the flow or lack of flow that you can get at a high level. And seeing workflow is kind of the, the whole point of the lean management movement and, and agile and, and all of these different you know, interrelated and, and um, complementary and interconnected ways of thinking about work. So processes and value streams in, in my world um, from my perspective are different. Now, the reason why value stream thinking is so powerful back to that siloed organizational structure I talked about is that what you want in order to, for a whole organization to go where it wants to go, for it to deliver what it wants to deliver to customers, everyone in the boat has to be rowing at pretty much the same pace or the boat is not gonna go in the direction that you intend for it to. So what we see all too often is you can even see these amazing hardworking teams that put really good improvement in place and it's measurable and it's significant and it's wonderful and they're excited. And yet the customer doesn't ever feel any difference as a result of that good work. And that's just unfortunate. It's wrong. It's wrong for a team to have all that excitement and it not really affect the customer. And so value stream thinking and, and viewing gives us a chance to actually connect everything together. We've even had value stream mapping teams that take a look across the value stream. And because of a constraint here or there, they actually slow up the whole upstream part of the value stream in order to be able to go at the same pace and get flow going. You're much more successful getting continuous flow, even if it's a little bit slower to begin with than you are if you have these fits and starts and then it sits and, and there's, there's these delays and all that. It, it, you know, it just it messes up the whole work system and the customer can feel it. So that's the most important thing is the customer can feel when there is not flow. So we want to work toward this top level, this design goal in the future state, especially is to get that boat going in the, in the right direction. So when you think about mapping, because everyone talks about value stream mapping, value stream mapping, value stream mapping, you know, I've been trying to preach as much as I can. It's not about the map. And that's not to minimize the importance of mapping. The, the mapping process is very important, but it's really about the conversations that occur while you're mapping, the insights that people get, the ahas, the decisions that are made when it comes to future state design. And frankly, what really gets me excited is the organizational healing we see. So almost 100% of the time, at some point in the planning process for going in and helping a client, somebody will say, these two departments don't get along, or these two leaders have a lot of tension, or these two work teams just, they just never really have seemed to gel, or whatever. And I'm always very excited to hear that because I know that we can help heal that. And so we bring those people together on the team. And again, almost 100% of the time, the healing occurs in, we happen to use a three-day model, three days in a row, or if it's virtual, it's in three-hour segments, it's the equivalent of three days. And in that process of putting these people together and having them see the work as it actually is, not what they think it is, not what they wish it were, but how it actually flows or doesn't flow, they actually start to understand each other's pain. And by understanding each other's pain, they start to be able to come together and collaborate to create a future state that is better for everyone. And so, you know, we hear over and over and over years after we've been in an organization helping them with a particular value stream, the tension that existed between two leaders or two departments melted away, we witnessed it, and it never came back that tension stayed away because they really understood each other. And then they became much better at collaborating and decision-making as time went on. So mapping is the means to the end. It is not the thing. So just remember that it's, it's a tool, it's a method, 
It's a way to invoke the conversations you need to have. It's, you know, sometimes it is tension filled in those mapping sessions because people are like, oh, yeah, yeah, what are we doing? Why are we doing it that way? And that's good to have that spirited conversation. You know, that's what's needed in order to really, you know, come to together for a future state. So the means to the, to the outcome and the output that you're actually looking for, the, you know, the ultimate output is transformation and a different way of working. But the step prior to that is a plan for how you're going to transform the value stream. And in order to get the plan, you need the maps to give you the insights and the design tool in order to create the plan. So it goes in reverse. Results comes from a plan, which comes from the mapping, which comes from the conversations and all of that that happens in the mapping. So this is just one example of a transformation plan that's been sanitized. Um, and it's, it's literally looking across a value stream and each line item is something, you know, in some cases they're pretty simple fixes and, and improvements. In some cases they're, they're quite clunky and, and difficult and they take time. And this is our, I call it a Gantt-ish chart. Um, it's just a directional time chart on the sequencing of what's going to be happening. And this time period, you'll notice it goes from November to March. Most of the future state uh, improvement cycles are three to nine months, 12 months. We sometimes will, you know, say, okay, it's, you know, if you have a construction project, for example, it may even go beyond 12 months, but if it's something internal and, you know, it could take 12 months, we want to keep it usually a little bit shorter because when people see 12 months, they don't start. <laughs> and we want people to start right away and start getting the benefit of that future state design as quickly as possible. So shorter time frames provide that bias to action that you need. So what are the patterns we see? And I'm going to be basically talking about the negative version of the patterns we see. And so of course, the positive patterns that we see are the opposite of the negative version of the pattern. So this one, I cannot talk about enough, but of course we only have 45 minutes together, so I won't talk about it a whole lot. Um, senior leaders are the ones that need to be on a mapping team, a, a value stream mapping team, if it's truly a value stream. And the reason why we need senior leaders on the team isn't because they're the people who know the current state intimately. In fact, they probably shouldn't know the current state that intimately, but we need a bias to the future state. The team needs to be biased toward the people that can authorize the future state. Because here's what you don't want. You don't want to spend time mapping. And again, like I said, we use a three-day model because we're usually traveling in and then you know have to fly back out. Usually three full days together in person, virtual three-hour segments. And when we have the people in the room for the future state design, if they come up with a design and a transformation plan or an action plan, that nobody has had the authority to say yes to in the room, then you have to have a sales cycle. You have to go out and sell the future state and sell the transformation plan. And once you, you know, disband the group, then that sales process becomes very, very lengthy. And they say, never say never. I have never seen a value stream transformation plan be successfully sold when it wasn't sold within the three days. I've never. Um, and it's just because the, you know, they weren't in the room, they didn't hear of all the background, of what led to this decision, and it's just, it is kind of a disaster. So you really need to think long and hard about the level of people you need on a mapping team if you're going to truly transform a value stream. Because we're not talking about rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, we're talking about building a new ship some of the time. And, um, and so it's not incremental, tiny little improvements you're looking for at the value stream level. Now, I'll, I'll show you a little more about that in a minute. So the thing about having leaders in the room is that first of all, this first bullet here, I, I, I can't emphasize enough how many leaders leave after day one, day two and say, wow, you know, I had no idea that that was what's really going on. I had no idea that there's that kind of pain. I had no idea that that was a problem. I had no, like, you know, I had no idea is one of the most common things we hear at the end of current state mapping. And that's scary, you know, because if leaders don't have any idea about some of these really vexing problems an organization faces, that they're going to not make the right decisions. They're not going to budget properly. There's going to be all kinds of ramifications of not understanding that. So critical to really get that, you know, that, that whole thing figured out and, and 
and have them understand the current state. That's one reason to have them on the team. The second reason is prioritization. So um, I wrote a book called Clarity First, and I talked a lot about clear priorities and the problem that we see in a lot of organizations is that there are very unclear priorities and rapidly changing priorities. When you get a full leadership team together, that agree on the priorities, or at least have consensus on the priorities, which doesn't mean they necessarily agree, but they're committing to, to the priorities and they're, they're gonna commit to that and stick with it. When you get a whole leadership team or part of a, a, a big value stream to really agree on that, then chances are much, much lower that priorities will come and usurp the resources and the funding and everything else, and you won't be able to get the value stream transformation done. So that's really important. And this final bullet point, Here's what happens, not only do you have that horrible sales cycle that you have to deal with if you don't have the right people in the room, but you also find that in the, the minute you pass the baton to the people that are closer to where the work is getting done, which is what you want to do, they are the experts in doing the work, once the strategy is set on what the future state should look like, you pass the baton to the people closer to the work to actually execute it. They will run into obstacle upon obstacle upon obstacle if leaders haven't already said yes to the plan. So it really slows improvement and in many cases stalls it completely where it never, never gets going again. So again, I can't emphasize enough, you know, it's tempting to put people that you think are more intimate with the current state, but you can get data in advance. You can go interview people during mapping. We do that all the time. We walk the value stream all the time. You can get that information. What you can't get if you have a manager or supervisor on a team is the vision and perspective and the authority to authorize the future state. So that's that's why you bias the team toward the future state. Okay, I'll, I'll stop now. <laughs> I'm very passionate about this because I see so many ineffective mapping sessions because the wrong level of people are on the team. So we were talking about it earlier and not to you know derail, but it, it's something that came up in uh, in a panel discussion. I think everybody's kind of reinforced that. And, uh, you know, even we've talked about some of the challenges. So you're not the only one. <laughs> good, 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 good. OK, pattern two, um, a charter is not a piece of paper to be feel, filled out. It is a piece of paper that drives a whole lot of conversations and decisions that allow a team to come together when you're ready to start mapping and get going and map. And you don't have to debate scope. You don't have to debate the measurement that you're gonna be using to define success. There's no debating. A charter, ours look kind of sort of like this. A charter is critical for first establishing a sense of urgency that everyone can agree with. You know, if you can get every, this gets into the psychology if you can get everyone to agree on the urgency of resolving a value stream problem, then you're already 50% there toward the future state. If you have people going, why are they doing this? What's the problem? You know, of course you're gonna get a lot of resistance. I say very frequently, if you're experiencing resistance to improvement, you're doing something wrong. Because either it's not improvement, it's just change, and just change is never good. It needs to be an improvement. And you know, if people aren't involved in understanding the why behind things, of course they're not gonna go along with it. You know, change is hard. So establishing that sense of urgency and socializing this charter, which doesn't mean attaching it to an email. It means actually having conversations about, hey, this is what we're gonna do. This is why we're gonna do it. This is what problems we are going to be solving. And you know, getting people really clear about it really helps. Defining success we see a lot of value stream mapping where there were no metrics to find up front and no targets that they were trying to achieve, which makes it hard to design the future state if you have no target you're going after. So we you know, push, push, push to get targets set up front, not during mapping so that people know what they're designing to. It may be that it's you know, a little aggressive and you have to scale back a little bit, but that's okay. At least you're you know, pushing ahead and, and having a defined place that you're going. It's like, you, know, you don't get a map out and say, I think I want to go on a trip and then get in the car and start the car and have no idea where you're going. I mean, you have to have some general idea you're going, where you're going. Scope, cannot, cannot talk about this enough as far as your, you know, value streams kind of never really have a, a major beginning and a major end. They kind of go on and on and on and on in both directions. So, you know, if you're in, you know, a sales an environment where sales is starting.
coming in from a customer. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that happens up front, the, you know, months long relationship building. And, and if you're in an organization with supply chain, there's you know, all kinds of supply chain uh, contracts and pricing and negotiation. And, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff up front. And if you're delivering a product, a good, then there's you know warranty work and returns and, and all that. There's, there's collecting revenue after you ship. If you're in a service and you're delivering some sort of a service, there's servicing the service, you know, and there's just so much before. So you have to define clear fence posts. And that can't be one person's decision. It needs to be multiple people that are going to be within this value stream you're looking at deciding together what problems are we trying to solve and where do they lie in the value stream. And that's when you pick your fence post so that you can capture those areas where those problems lie. And um, you know, I have a situation right now I'm going through with a prospective client. And we're starting to talk about what the scope is going to be. And they, they are not aligned at all on what the scope should be. And um, I'm, I'm pretty much saying then we're not ready to start. You know, when, when we get clear on scope, then we're ready to start until you guys, you know, and I can help you, but you know, until you get to that point where you, you four are uh, in alignment, it, there's no point starting. Lastly, and most importantly, as I mentioned, the team, one thing I'll just mention, you'll notice there's 10 little spots here. That's it, no more ever. That's the only thing I don't flex on. <laughs> no more. I've tried 11. I've tried 12. I've tried 13. I've tried 14. I've tried 15. You know, it's, there's something weird that happens when you get more than 10 people talking about a focused situation and it, it really slows everything down. So keep your number of cooks in the kitchen to 10 and you're likely to get good results. All right. Pattern number three, mapping at the wrong level. I mentioned this in the beginning. You know, processes are, you know, typically shorter duration. They typically don't have as many handoffs to different parts of the organization. Um, one, one thing that we use to determine whether it's a process or a value stream is how many functional areas are involved in the work. And if the number is five or more, then it's starting to smell a little bit like a value stream. If the, and we also ask what's the total duration once you have the fence post set, from the beginning to the ending process within this presumed value stream. And if the number is two weeks or more, it smells a little bit like a value stream. If it's months, it's definitely a value stream. If it's years, it is absolutely a value stream that you're talking about and not a process. So number of steps or handoffs and the duration of the period are the ones that help us determine at least at a glance, whether it smells more like a value stream or a process. So this is blurred very intentionally. Um, I, there's no way to sanitize this and not have it be somewhat indicative of what it is and who it is. Um, so this is the point of me showing this is this is a value stream. Um, well, I wouldn't even say what it's about. So what, what I wanna show here is the IT system. So one thing that differentiates, differentiates a value stream map from a process map is that you see information flow very, very vividly in a value stream map. And that's one great help, especially when you get outside of manufacturing into the knowledge work arena where you can't see any of the work. It's great to be able to visualize what's happening. And in this case, what you'll see are a whole lot of inter, um, not connected, disconnected um, pieces of their information system, system. And the backstory here that I didn't know until the briefing one day in the mapping session was that they had been lobbying, they mean part of the team, for budget to create some interconnections with some of these systems for three budget cycles, three years. And they've got shot, they got shot down every time. What was really wonderful to see when the CTO walked into the briefing after day two and saw this on the wall, it was in paper and post-its on the wall at this point, you know, his mouth dropped open and, and he said, you know what, I, I never really saw that this was what we were dealing with on paper before, like this is just crazy. And they got budget within three weeks, they moved budget from a couple of line items and got budget to do some pretty major um, connections between some of these systems. I mean, if you look at each process block and the different colored lines, that's separate data entry into separate systems that one process is doing. And so, um, you know, this was quite the mess and they cleaned it up quite nicely. Now, this is another uh, value stream 
map and you'll also see the information systems up here. What I want to point out here is that you know people sometimes get a little confused about you know can you have branching and can you show different variations within a value stream map? And the answer is as long as the map is still incredibly clear for people to read, you can do whatever you want. The problem is when it becomes unreadable because there's too much complexity on the map, then you've crossed the line into now it's not a great visual storyboard. Now it's a big mess, just like the value stream, and it doesn't really help. So <clears throat> what you'll see here are these different colors represent different functional areas. And you'll see that work is being passed. And there are five different teams doing work pretty much concurrently in this value stream. So you can show variation it doesn't ever it doesn't have to always be linear and and um you know step one two three four etc so you you have that that ability this happens to be software development for uh, an insurance industry client and uh just wanted to point that out that you absolutely can have you could even have it's not on this map but you can even have work that sometimes goes four five six and sometimes goes from four to six you can have a little bit of branching like that. Okay, not honoring human psychology. So, you know, one of my sayings is don't fight city hall. <laughs> and, and so don't fight human psychology. You know, people are people. And, and I think sometimes we have these really unrealistic views of how people should behave and how they should think and all those things. And so there's a lot you can do in value stream mapping that really leverages human psychology in addition to reducing the resistance to improvement. There's a lot you can do. And one of the most powerful things I recommend you try if you haven't, uh, we absolutely love them, is having briefings. This happens to be pre-COVID um, and soon post-COVID or post, we're gonna do it anyway. <laughs> whatever it is. Um, uh, so these briefings are people that aren't on the mapping team that are key stakeholders, maybe one level down in the organization. They come in every day or two or come into a, a virtual mapping session. And the mapping team presents what they've learned in the case of the current state, presents what they are thinking about from a planning and a design perspective for the future state, and then eventually you know, present what they believe is a, a reasonable and responsible action plan in order to realize that future state design. And so if you look down here at the, you know, if, there's three, if there are three briefings, like the first one is to get everyone seeing beyond the mapping team, the same things that they just spent a lot of time looking at and feeling the pain of it, frankly. You want people to see the pain of the current state clearly and unequivocally so that they can't go, well, there's nothing wrong with that. Why do we want to improve? You, know? you want them to go, oh, like, come on, let's do something. You know, that's, that's, that's leveraging psychology. And then the consensus toward the future happens with the future state design. You want people to go, all right, we're in. You know, this, this makes sense to us. I don't see anything unreasonable there. Let's do it. And then on the third day with the action plan, you want people to go, yes, this is, we're going to make this a priority and this we are going to roll and this is the way that we're going to achieve the results that we're looking for. So these briefings become, you know, I think what happens a lot is that people think that they'll get this little group together and then just kind of close everyone out. But that's why that charter socialization process up front allows a lot of people to get behind the activity and behind the need for it and what they are going to be experiencing with the future state design changes. And during the activity, you're allowing people to grow with the learning and grow with the understanding and, and see what, why the future state is being suggested instead of just going, oh, no, you know, if they're not involved in it, of course, they're, you know, it's human nature to resist things that we're not involved in or don't understand why. So that's using psychology in your favor. Um, and then the last pattern I want to go through to is just insignificant results. I mean, these activities typically take four to six weeks to plan. If you're going to do them in person and you happen to be flying people in from different locations, it might even take longer to plan it, you know, so that people can clear their schedules. And you know, we've had um, activities that were based on the East Coast because there were people coming in from Australia, Europe, Asia, you know, and, and we all converged in one location. Of course, this is pre-COVID. 
Um, but you know, the value stream mapping, I want to just make a, a play for in-person mapping. You know, I think we're, I think the next couple of years will be interesting to see if we overdo virtual now that we have a choice. And we stick with virtual in even in situations when we shouldn't be sticking with virtual, or if we kind of get back to understanding the value of in person work. <clears throat> and this value stream work, you're not, again, you're not rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. You can do that virtually just fine. But when you're making significant decisions to make significant improvements and investments, you know, it's a lot easier to do that in person. Body language becomes so important. And when I'm virtually facilitating, which I did, I, don't know, I did lots of value stream work during COVID, but you know, here I am looking at you, my other monitor's over here. So if I want to look at you, I have to look over here and then here I'm mapping and then here I'm looking and here I'm mapping. You miss a lot of body language that's really important to understand are people with you or not? Are they, are there, are two people disagreeing? And if you don't have your Brady Bunch showing up over here and looking at it, then you miss that. So it's, it's really important. So results, when you are doing value stream work, again, this should be pretty transformative kinds of improvements that are being um, considered for the future state design. So here's an example of a real value stream map where it was a 14 week lead time or elapsed time from order to receipt in the current state. They wanted to get it to six. They were able to get it to seven within a, I think this one was an eight, eight month transformation cycle. So that's a 50% improvement. I have seen lead time improvements up to 80% because there was so much waiting and waste in that part of the process that they were able to get rid of all that and it greatly shrunk the lead time. The process time or the actual touch time, the work effort to do the work hardly ever gets quite that big because it's it's not as easy to squeeze actual work time as it is to squeeze waiting time down to zero. Um, and so in this case, they got a 20% improvement and the activity ratio is the ratio between those two and it shows how much is work flowing or not flowing. And so in the case of this one, they got a 75% incre increase in the um, activity ratio, but look, the work is still only flowing 28% of the time. 100% is true flow. And so there's still a lot of work, but you know, I'll take a 75% improvement. I think that's pretty, pretty uh, responsible. And then finally, the quality metric we use for non-manufacturing, non-good related value streams is uh, percent complete and accurate. It's a measure of information instead of a good. And that you can get, actually, we've seen like 1,500% improvements because sometimes it starts out at zero. Because when one process in a value stream says, none of the time do I get all the information or all the correct information I need to do my work, then of course the answer is zero for the entire value stream. So these are the key metrics and there's a whole lot more that are unique to each value stream that we use, but these are the core ones for most value streams. So we're looking again at significant improvements, not shaving 10%, 20%, no. I mean, it's, you're, you're, you're swinging for the fences on value stream work. So, um, so it's three o'clock, um, so my time, I'm in central. Um, so I wanted to just give you kind of some triggers to spark some conversation. And so I'm hoping that you have all kinds of questions that we can, we can talk about. And I will, let's see, how am I gonna get back on chat? Here we go, oh, 73, oh, wow. But that's probably from before, right? Yeah, so uh, let's okay. see. I mean, if you have a question for Karen, just put it in the chat. Um, Let me see where, uh, where do I start? I don't think there, I've been monitoring and there's just been discussion. I don't know if there's anything. If you do have a question uh, about examples, yeah, and Steve provided. So maybe, um, I don't know, Steve, if you want to elaborate or uh, see uh, Cecilia, Cecilia um, on your question, but. Uh... Sure, thank you so much. Um, I was just saying it's 9 p.m. here where I am right now and oh. uh, kind of I'm thinking of it's, it's a bit hard to, to think about this concept without examples. And I was just wondering if you could uh, share a couple of examples where kind of I can link these concepts a bit more easily. Uh, uh, 
I haven't do done you, any value stream mapping work in the past. Okay. Are you asking for examples of value streams or? Yes. Or like what, what would you like in, in your work, like what type of value stream? And I'm actually interested in different types rather than just, you know, uh, we discussed about software delivery, which is a value uh, stream, but how about compliance, for example, or uh, any other thing, which is a bit more cross-cutting, okay. but still value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good question. Um, so you mentioned compliance just now, and I'll just start out by saying that what a value stream is not is a functional role or area. A value stream is a, a request, a repeatable request that's coming in either internal or external customer, and then you're delivering on that request. So that request could be software. That request could be um, surgery in healthcare. That request could be a fine meal in a restaurant. Request could be a bank loan, a mortgage loan, you know, to buy a house. Um, that request could be any number of things. Internally, organizations also have what we call support value streams. So a lot of the tech space resides in, in a support value stream arena where an internal customer is asking for hardware, software, combination, whatever it might be, in order for them to serve the customer, to deliver value to the customer. And the tech department is supporting, you know, the selection, purchase, implementation, all that of that tool that they need in order to, um, to provide value to a customer. HR also, the whole hiring, onboarding, that we do quite a bit of value stream mapping on that whole kind of hiring process. But that's again, a support value stream. And it's something that takes months to complete typically um, that support, supports the delivery of value. Um, what, what industry are you in? Uh, software, uh, okay. infrastructure, hardware, all of, all of that. Okay, are you within a company that delivers a, a good or service to customers or you or that is the company is the whole tech? Right now I'm, I'm transitioning to consulting. So at the moment okay. I don't work, but this okay. is very interesting. I would to say me get, uh, like get Karen's <laughs> book on value mapping. It has good examples and- Yeah, uh, I have lots of examples you. in there. Yeah. 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 But uh, that, let's, uh, let's see if others has any questions. I don't want to take like all okay. day. Okay. Friendly. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hope that helped. Uh, let's see if anyone else is dropping any questions. How much prep work? Um, so, you know, I would say definitely a month and it's not a, you know, full-time month worth of work. It's just in order to select a value stream. Like some organizations actually spend the time up front to define their value streams before they even select one to work on. Most organizations seem to already have known pain. And so we just help them define what value stream that is based on whatever pain they have. Um, you know, the upfront process, we, we typically have about, I'd say anywhere from four to eight phone calls with a very small core group of people that are leaders that have, you know, big stake in the value stream improvement work. Um, we also have a data analysis portion, usually in value streams where we define what we need. Um, a lot of times you have timestamps in a computer system for different segments of a value stream and getting those value, getting those timestamps up front helps see the truth about the current state. So no one has to guess on the percent complete and accurate metric that hardly ever exists. Um, I mean, hardly ever. I, I actually, I don't think I've ever seen it exist up front. So the team does have to take a stab at that. Um, and so there's that whole data piece. There's logistics. I mean, if you are gonna do it in person, you know, there's a certain room size that works and other rooms don't work because they're too small. If you're going to walk the value stream, which we do, even if it means walking from one cubicle to another office, to another cubicle, to an open, work area, you know, we do walk the value stream and then the team interviews the people and asks them about workflow or lack of flow and the problems they're experiencing. So there's that logistics part of it. Um, and then team selection is always tricky. Like I have three of them right now that are going to be in the summer months and we can't pick a week that there's any one day that everybody, everybody that they want on the team, <coughs> excuse me, is there because of vacations. So there's, you know, I would definitely plan at least a month and possibly six weeks 
if you have people that are fairly accessible and available. Um, let's see what else. Uh, what are the differences between non-software organization results and software orgs related to value stream efforts? Specifically, are there specific things to pay attention when dealing with software orgs? Oh my, could I go on? Um, so first of all, one of the things that I, as a facilitator, um, warn people upfront about clients that are, when we're talking about software value stream and push hard on is the whole, you guys are probably gonna kill me, the whole concept of backlog. <laughs> I mean, I could go on and on about backlog and the, the paradigms that exist in software development around backlogs and the number of people I've met that their, their whole existence seems to be predicated on having a, a large backlog and things, and things like that, that from a, from a lean perspective, backlog is not good. And, um, and so, you know, we work hard to figure out and, and every single client, every single software value stream we've worked on, there's so much pain around backlog. So that is a big difference that nobody else, I mean, there are always queuing that occur in other value streams, but not that. I mean, it's, it's it, it, backlogs are, are a big pain point. The other thing that I will say is that 95% of the time, the business case piece of software development internally, um, it, it's like the business case part of a value stream is always pretty broken. Um, a lot of times I think that uh, the business owners just have, you know, hardly any training, if at all, if at all, on how to even write a business case. Sometimes the business case requirements are so onerous that nobody except for a PhD in business case development can even um, meet the requirements. So there's a lot around business case development that we find a common um, current state pain point. And then finally, the approval process, the whole toll gate piece and approval process. I mean, you know, approvals are not value adding. Code is, good code is. Bad code is not, um, but but the just the different you know places where you know, testing is important. I mean, self inspection and testing is all very important. Um, but approval after adequate testing is something that we go after. So those are some of the common current state problems we see. Hope that helps. Um, including senior leaders in a value stream mapping assumes you have access. You've been invited to coach senior leaders. If you don't have that access, what can you do? So that's a good question, but it kind of depends on who's who's the trigger behind the need to do value stream mapping and what level are they? I do see a pretty low success rate for people that are, you know, kind of like, um, well, manager means different things in different organizations, but let's say it's a hierarchical organization that goes kind of sort of supervisor, manager, director, vice president, C-level. Uh, managers often are very eager to solve value stream pain, but yet, you know, you really need the director VP and sometimes even C level on the team in order to get the future state design um, approved the way that you need it approved. So you have to get to senior leaders or you hobble along and do a value stream at a manager level and, and, you know, get you can get improvement that's within the purview of a manager it's just not the big you know big strategic improvement you can get with a higher level leader on the team so yeah you you know you have if you want to do real transformation in value streams that's not rearranging deck chairs on the titanic it takes senior leaders so you have to find your way up that totem pole and there's a lot of sales involved. You have to sell the need for it. You have to sell that value stream is the way to, to achieve the results. You have to sell that you're the person to champion it. You know, there's a lot of sales involved in getting leaders to open their minds to new ways of operating. Uh, let's see. I'm skipping the OKR one. I laughed. Did you see me laugh? I don't know. Um, you know so we don't use the term OKRs, but, but what we do are OKRs. Um, and so you do need to set those up front as far as your targets. Typically, we don't set the OKRs that are going to be used to manage a value stream on an ongoing basis until we've gotten through the future state and, and know clearly what the future state looks like. Then we set them. But they sometimes tweak a little bit, even in the improvement cycle. While, as you're realizing the future state, you sometimes change your OKRs. And then, then they're set. So um, uh, 
how are value streams, organizational model, and business processes related? Would you say that for more effective improvement of flow, one would need to go to the process level? Well, um, to get to true root cause of flow problems, you do have to go to the micro level. So the value stream, I'm glad you asked this because I didn't really say this. The value stream work is looking at a high level of flow and lack of flow, but you don't get into the actual root cause analysis of why between two blocks there's a stoppage. There, there could be something very obvious, like we batch, we do it once a week. You know, that's obvious. But usually you have to go into a little more root cause analysis to see why something is really waiting or why the quality isn't what it should be and that type of thing. And yes, that is at a process level. But the good news about value stream work is that you typically don't have to go to every single process in the value stream and do that analysis. So you can move more quickly toward results when you don't have to take every process and analyze it, which is what you know pre-value stream people used to do. Spend I mean, you can time. use also like causal loop diagrams and apply kind of systems thinking tools to look at you know what's actually affecting it. So. Yeah, yeah. Let me see, what time is it? We're time. Time. yeah. Time. <laughs> it's this is fun. Time. I can keep. I love keeping uh, asking more questions and answering more questions. But we're at time. We can keep it. Yeah, I mean, like the last fifteen minutes is just really for people to share their takeaways uh, and uh, and see if there's any other questions. There's uh, a, a good uh, discussion, I guess. But do, do we need backlogs? <laughs> backlogs are good. So I'm enjoying reading the conversation. You know, it's always. Uh, <laughs> Logs are a list of sadness. I love that, Steve. <laughs> they are. Uh, so leading code can be value add. I agree. I agree. Yes, so backlogs are some. Everyone knows that everyone's busy. I agree. <laughs> anyway, so. So thank you, Karen. I don't know if uh, anybody want to, I know uh, th there are a lot of questions and, you know, obviously we can't cover everything. I know even during the panel discussion, there was a lot more. We could spend two days, I think, and still not get through everything. Mm -hmm.